Hello, I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. And I'm Alice Vale. At the height of racial tension in Darby in 1968, a house was founded where blacks and whites can learn and play together peacefully. Well, tonight we'll meet the founder of that house and we'll go to the house itself. We'll also meet a man involved in race relations in a different way. C.P. Ellis was a high-ranking official in the Ku Klux Klan. All that has changed now. Our short segments tonight include a visit to a Trappist monastery and people in places with a look at a unique music program in Pittsburgh. have a lot of energy and it's important that that energy be channeled into the right directions. Ethel Smiley has been doing just that for a number of years now and not only has she helped to channel the energy of young people but that of old people as well. For people in the Darby, Pennsylvania area, whether they are young, old, or in between, there's a place on South Main Street that offers them friendship, fun, help, understanding, and love. The place is Freedom House, and its founder is Mrs. Ethel Smiley. Born in Dublin, Georgia, the daughter of a poor sharecropper, Ethel Smiley came to this area in 1934 because she believed she could build a better life for herself in the North. She worked at several different jobs, but none fulfilled her as much as when she worked with young people. I asked her, how did this get started? Well, I started working with young people because I had a son and, I, and an adopted daughter. And they were always wanting to go somewhere, bring kids in. And in, in doing that, I found that there were a lot of kids was not ad as advantaged as my own kids were. And the more we got involved, the farther we got, the more involved I got with young people. And the more I liked it because uh, I could see that the young people needed it. They needed somebody to talk to, somebody to listen to their tales, somebody, someone to supervise them, someone that they could turn to when they were in trouble. Mm -hmm. And all, all the time, even before there was a Freedom House, my house was very full. My husband had to come in sometime when he got from work and find places to step <laughs> in order to get through the house. But, um, I liked it very much because I was helping children to find themselves. Mrs. Smiley organized a junior and senior youth council which included over 600 kids. Named statewide youth counselor for the NAACP, she resigned from the position because the traveling kept her away from the community for too long. She wanted to work with the kids in Darby. She envisioned a place where young people, both white and black, could come to learn and play and be together. She envisioned Freedom House. That was in 1968, but it wasn't until two years later that the vision became a reality because area residents harshly opposed the idea. And they just didn't think it should be used here and also on Main Street and also in a white area. So we got a lot of rejection. We became a, a political football, in other words. That didn't stop Ethel Smiley. She was determined to stick with it, and the youth center was opened. I have a very good friend, the mailman, I mean the postmaster, who laughingly tells me that where they gather up at the firehouse, they used to call me that crazy woman down there. <laughs> So we stuck to it, and we kept letting people know that this was not uh, a place for just black people. It was a place for all people mm -hmm. in need. It crossed all political lines, all racial lines, all uh, religious lines. It's just mean people helping people.
filled it with the program that we structured their, their um, energy in the right way, in a way to build, in a way to communicate with other people, in a way to uh, try to do something positive instead of destroy. Mm -hmm. We feel that also with the youth program, we teach them that in order to take, they must give. And many of them hang on the corners. They are out there daring each other to do things, but if they're coming into the center, they're doing constructive things. Mm -hmm. It's been the energy, and you know children, young people have a lot of energy. So instead of the energy, energy being um, channeled into the wrong direction where they will destroy, it's channeled in the right direction where they will help to build mm -hmm. for the future. God is great. What happened is that the demands in the community grew. We found that we needed a day kiss, and very early we started, we opened up, we started taking care of people's children so they could go to work to supplement mm -hmm. their income or to supplement their check or something. Mm -hmm. So we, that is the way the, the day care center was the second thing that got started. Today there are 42 kids ages 3 to 5 enrolled in the Freedom House Day Care Center. They are supervised by certified teachers and several assistants. Each day is filled with planned activity that includes a health check, structured play, lessons, a balanced meal, and a nap. And from what I could see, the kids love every minute of it. The better known Freedom House became in the community, the more people came there for help and advice. Mrs. Smiley noticed that many of these people were older adults seeking legal advice or help with various problems. This prompted her to organize the Senior Citizen Center. Today, the Senior Center has about 40 regular members who come to learn crafts, go on trips, enjoy a nutritious meal, and most important, to socialize. And, uh, they tell me, come down here. The doctor said, you go down there and get a meal, be around people to talk to. So I did. And I've been here ever since, and I don't want to miss it. This is my home. Instead of people sitting uh, with a group head and waiting to die and think, thinking that nobody cares, they come here, they have fun, they make things, they go, to, go on trips. And it's something to keep the mind involved. And I find that keeping the mind of old people involved, they don't, they don't become senile so quickly. Mm -hmm. If you can keep uh, their minds busy, keep them doing something, they will also, they will not become dependent on other people to take care of them. But for Ethel Smiley, taking care of people seems to be a way of life. The responsibilities of a place like Freedom House are awesome, and yet regardless of what else she's doing, there always seems to be time to listen to the teenagers, or laugh with the seniors, or play with the kids. I was amazed at her good nature and abundant energy, so much so that I had to ask her a secret. Uh, I have a lot of faith. I have uh, a lot of patience. I have a lot of um, wanting to, not wanting to be dependent, but wanting to help people. And I think if you have a lot of faith and you really want to, to do something, I think I, I go about this as a mission in my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I enjoy doing it. I find that helping people also help oneself mm -hmm. because it gives me a great satisfaction to know that I've helped somebody today. Love is all you need. Because of recent government budget cuts, money for the Freedom House Youth Center has been eliminated. And that's ironic because it's been the Youth Center that was the basis of the Freedom House Center. Well, I don't think that will stop Ethel Smiley. She's determined to keep the youth center open, and I'm sure she'll find a way.
the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers, Georgia, the monks sanctify the hours and work of each day. They sing hymns of praise, known as Gregorian chant. If you think these second graders are having a good time, you're right. But they're also learning a little bit about music, a little bit about themselves. They're just a few of the 200 children that benefit from a multifaceted program in the arts. It's a program that brings together Duquesne University in Pittsburgh with nearby St. Benedict the Moore Elementary School. Together, they make beautiful music. From eurythmics to band to choral, their sounds echo through the halls each day. These two women coordinate the program, Sister Marjorie, principal at St. Benedict's, and Frances Prue, Duquesne's representative. The name of the program reflects their combined efforts. St. Benedict plus Duquesne becomes Beneduc. Duquesne provides the teachers, the instruments, which the children would not be able to afford otherwise. And we rent the instruments to the children for a very nominal fee, and their lessons are very inexpensive. And financially, we as a school could not provide uh, a music program such as this. And so with Duquesne's um, help and the, uh, the grant that we do have, it gives them that opportunity for the arts that uh, they would never have before. Even the youngest children at St. Benedict's, like kindergarten student Andre Adams, can learn more about music. So as individuals and as group members, students can pursue their interests. The music program teaches them a sense of responsibility, but uh, more than that, it teaches them to be responsible to their own peers, to be responsible to their friends, to make them, everyone look better. They all have to do a job. An example of the growth of the students in the band program is I remember when I first came here last year, they said, oh, at the end of the year, let's, let's go to what? An amusement park, okay? This year, they were asking me, oh, can we go to the symphony? Um. 
Even Rocky had to start training somewhere. For most of these children, their introduction to music begins at Benedict. Who knows what the future holds for each of them? Clairborn C.P. Ellis was once the exalted Cyclops of the Durham, North Carolina chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. The bitterness and aggravation which led him into the Klan are all gone now. His life has been calmed, and he is at peace with himself and all those around him, even if they are a different color. active in the Klan. I was sincere as I knew how to be. I really believed that what I was doing was in the best interest of this country, and I put everything I had into it. Now, the thing that, that, that bothers me sometimes is much of my adult life was really engulfed in racism and hatred for other people. I mean, and black people, uh, Jewish people who assisted them, I thought who helped them. Catholic people who helped them, and I, I, I hated the other groups as bad as I did the black people. And I think one of the hardest lessons that I've ever had to learn in my life that black people were not my enemy. About 10 years ago, Claiborne C.P. Ellis was the exalted Cyclops or president of the Durham, North Carolina chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. He's now business manager of the local 465 affiliated with the International Union of Operating Engineers and is no longer a member of the Klan. His was a struggle that almost tore him apart, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. A struggle that led him to alcohol. A struggle that he eventually won. Uh, I came to the point in my life where I asked myself the question, why have you fought and hated black people all of your life? And I did not have an answer. I searched with everything I had to try to find an answer, and I could not find an answer. And this really troubled me. My whole life had been spent fighting uh, people for no reason. I couldn't think of any time that black person had done anything to hurt me. And I, I was really a stripped and a torn man at that time. And I had to try to find out why. And that's when I had to relive my entire life to find out why. Reliving his childhood, C.P. remembered sitting at the breakfast table with his father, a Klan member, talking about how necessary the Klan was in the Reconstruction period. His father told him that the Klan was the greatest organization in the country, and that if it wasn't for the Klan, blacks would have taken over the nation. C.P. used to sneak up to the attic to put on and admire his father's robe. This area is the area that I lived in as a young child and as a young adult. Uh, it's really the low-income section of Durham, and all of most all of this, I think now, is black people living here. There was white saying, "All right, here's the house, that, the first house that I remember living in, and it's been fixed up since. Since then, really, it's been painted. Uh, it had an outside toilet, no electric uh, lights, uh, no furnace. And really, that that's a house I would say I was born in." 
Oh gosh, before I started the school, we moved from this house up just shortly here, and I'll show you. This is the house where my father would take me upstairs. This is where he had his room, uh, the one on the corner here. Uh, this, this is the house that I spent most of my adult life in, and that's been fixed up too. It's been shingled. There was a back porch here. Uh, we had a nice box out on the back porch. There's the upstairs. I spent a lot of, lot of days on that front porch, so. and nice too, as a youngster, and as a young adult too. In fact, my wife and I lived in the house when we first got married. My father taught me this kind of philosophy, that if, if you're white, and if you do right, and you, you know, salute the flag, obey the police department, go to church, then good things will happen. No matter how hard C.P. tried to honor his father's philosophy, he began to notice that things were not getting better. C.P. borrowed money and bought a gas station, but was barely able to keep it afloat. At about that time, the civil rights movement began, and blacks were demonstrating, gaining some momentum and starting to get better jobs in the community. C.P. became more and more embittered. There he was, a person who was supposed to make some progress, according to his father's philosophy, going nowhere. And I began to say to myself, by God, something's wrong. And you know, these things are not supposed to happen. And I guess at that time, I was searching for somebody to put the responsibility on. Now, in order to put that responsibility on some, somebody, you got to have something tangible to look at. And, you know, I began to say something wrong with the government, something wrong with the church, something wrong, with it. and I, but you know, they didn't satisfy. So as blacks began to, to move forward in the civil rights movement, I found the enemy. And I said, it's black people's fault. They're the ones cause it all. C.P. met some Klansmen and joined himself. With time, he quickly moved up in the ranks, from member to chaplain, from chaplain to vice president, from vice president to president, or exalted cyclops. After he became president, he began to wonder whether the Klan's policy of secrecy might limit its effectiveness. He decided to attend public forums and let his identity be known. This is where he met his most bitter rival, Ann Atwater. I didn't give a damn about it. You know, I couldn't have cared whether he moved another minute. You know, that's just the way I felt. Because a uh, Klan, just the word Klan, what it represented to me was somebody always out to destroy black people, poor people, period. CP was receiving nightly calls from city officials asking them to bring men to city meetings in order to counter large black turnouts. But C.P. began to notice that the same men that asked for help at night would avoid him during the day. He was being used. Then something happened. The state AFL-CIO received a grant from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to try to solve racial problems in the school system. Both C.P. and Ann were asked to be in charge. He and I both went out and tried to recruit people to come to the meeting. And um, he was chased out of his neighborhood, and I was out of mine. And uh, they, they called me a traitor, and they called him a nigger lover. I began to see so clearly that low-income white people and black people had so much in common. And I, time and time again, things like it happened to that school program. The program was over. And I never will forget, there was a person in there I considered a real left-wing liberal woman that I had uh, hated to start with but had got to know her in the school program and felt, you know, not in a section mind, but felt close to her. Felt like, you know, I, I could detect in her a caring for people, not just black people, white people too. C.P. quit the Klan after the school program ended. He also found out that because of his actions, he was being rejected by his society. Torn by this, C.P. took to alcohol. After a year of heavy drinking and almost losing his mind, he hospitalized himself and sought counsel. The last session that I remember going to regularly, it dawned on me as I left the building. This, and it was like a truck lifted off my back, and that's why some people said it was a religious conversion. It's not, no, it's not. There's nothing wrong with religious conversion, but that's not what it was. It dawned on me as I got in my car, hey, there's nothing wrong with social change. Social change is no crime. 
You don't have to live your life fighting and hating other people. And since then, God, I, I have felt completely different. And that's been several years ago. But I feel like I'm just beginning to live. Next week, we will not be here because the Phillies game will be telecast. But we will be right back here on Channel 17 two weeks from now. We want you to meet a priest who leaves a lasting impression on everyone he meets. We'll also visit a correctional center for women in North Carolina. Our short segments include a story of Veronica and her veil, mimed by Betsy Beckman and Bill Noonan, and a visit to a clown, puppet, mime, and dance ministry workshop. We'd like to thank all of the people who have written in and offered so much support for Real to Real. We really appreciate that. And we'd like to thank you for being with us again this week. We'll see you again next week. We've enjoyed being with you because this special feast day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, and we pray with you that the Holy Spirit's gifts and fruits are full in your life. Goodbye and God bless you. Thank you.